Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. I saw a really interesting obituary in the Globe and Mail just a little while ago about Francis Fox. I was a young liberal uh, at the time that he resigned and uh, very hopeful about uh, the role that uh, uh, Francis Fox would have played uh, within the, the government of Canada and was shocked when uh, when he resigned and, and very saddened by it. Uh, and then the obituary, uh, you know, I had forgotten about Francis Fox to be candid uh, uh, and hadn't followed his uh, career much after uh, he left politics and was uh, was really moved by the the obituary. And so I reached out to uh, the author of the obituary, uh, Alan Freeman, and found out that um, Mr. Freeman is quite a prolific uh, author of obituaries and other articles. Uh, and so I thought it would be really interesting to hear a little bit about Francis Fox, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about obituary uh, writing and, and some of the other things that uh, Mr. Freeman has is, uh, is been involved in. Uh, he was named a senior fellow to the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs uh, at the University of Ottawa in 2014. He came to the U of, U of O in 2011 as a public servant in residence from Canada's Department of Finance, where he served as the Assistant Deputy Minister of Consultations and Communications. He joined the public service in 2008 after a distinguished career in, career in journalism as a parliamentary reporter and a business journalist for the Canadian Press, the Wall Street Journal, the Globe and Mail. At the Globe, he spent more than 10 years as a foreign correspondent based in Berlin, London, and Washington. He's a graduate of McGill and Columbia University, where he received a master's degree in journalism. So he's got great academic qualifications, an incredible journalism career. He's now a uh, an author and an author of obituaries and opinion pieces and uh, very knowledgeable, obviously, in politics. And, uh, you know, some of the articles that I've read about uh, why Canada should not move its embassy to Jerusalem and uh, and Canada is a Trojan horse and celebrating uh, what's risen since the Berlin Wall fell. He's got a wealth of uh, of writing that uh, we could spend uh, hours discussing. him. But, Mr. Freeman, let's talk about Francis Fox to start with. Um, you said that you got quite a response to this obituary. So I'm, I'm not the only one that was uh, was influenced by it and 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 moved by it. Yeah, I think, um, well, I did get a lot of response. I post the obituaries I write for the Globe on my LinkedIn page. So I, I don't know if it's a scientific indicator at all, but this one has had a huge amount of response. Repostings, thousands of uh, people viewing it, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I try to figure this out more than, you know, and I've, I, I don't mean to be uh, uh, sort of flippant about it, but I've written, uh, I've basically uh, written obits on much of the Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau cabinet in recent years, Don Johnson, Monique Bégin, Marc Lalonde, uh, among others. And so uh, Paul Hellyer, well, I'm not sure if he was ever, I think he was in a Trudeau cabinet for a while. So uh, this one particularly got a lot of interest. Now I'm trying to figure it out I think it's, you know, there always is a certain amount of nostalgia of people. Um, now, he was a minister and resigned and came back. This is over 40 years ago. So for people to have a, actually a, um, a live memory, you, people have to be in their 60s and over. And of course, those are often the people who read these obituaries. Um, and I think it represented a certain era uh, and beyond just... Uh, partisanship. Uh, it was an era when there were pretty uh, impressive people in politics. Now, Francis Fox, to go over for people who don't remember, uh, was from Montreal. He was from one of these classic uh, French Canadian, Irish, uh, Quebec families, grew up uh, speaking English and French at home, went to French schools, went to Brebeuf, which is where, you know, Pierre Trudeau went, uh, Justin Trudeau went. So pretty uh, exclusive classical college, and then went to University of Montreal for law school. Then he went to Harvard, got a master's of law, and was a Rhodes Scholar in uh, Oxford afterwards, came back to Montreal, began a, uh, a legal career, and ended up with the Trudeau government in, um, in Ottawa, working for the prime minister's office, and then ran for politics when he was quite young, 32. So... Um, and had a very meteoric rise and then fall. And um, one of the things that was interesting about him is the, it was a really big story at the time for people who 
weren't there or don't recall, he was solicitor general. And now that's sort of the equivalent of what public safety minister is these days. So he was responsible for the RCMP. And there was a lot of controversy going on at the time because the RCMP, this is before the days of CSIS, before we had uh, you know, a, an intelligence service, they had a, a, an intelligence service within the RCMP. And uh, it was a time of you know, national unity crisis, separatism, October crisis. And the RCMP was found to have done all sorts of dirty tricks um, to uh, try to combat separatists. They burnt down a barn. They had, you know, been involved in, you know, opening mail, you know, getting uh, secret information, et cetera. So, and there were several inquiries. This had come been disclosed. There were all sorts of inquiries. About to begin, there was a royal commission that was called. And so Fox was on really the hot seat in questioning period every day. This is in the late 70s, 77, 78, and was apparently doing quite well, responding, right? And then one day, out of the blue, he gets up in the house and says, I am forced to resign. For essentially a personal matter, he had, and it was unclear when exactly it was, had had uh, what he called a brief liaison, basically an affair with a married woman. She got pregnant and she had gone for an abortion. And at the time, people don't recall, abortion was covered under the criminal code. You had to go through therapeutic abortion committees at hospitals, whatever it was, the hospital had asked for a signature and signature of the husband. And Fox had forged the signature. He had written, you know, he had signed the signature of another man, uh, uh, the, the husband of the, the woman who had got pregnant, and somehow that information had got to the prime minister's office. Anonymous letter, I believe. I, I, I don't have all of the details from reading the old articles. And uh, Trudeau, you know, confronted him and said, what's this about? And he decided he had no choice but to resign. He was actually sort of like the chief legal officer for the governor of Canada, right? And so this was a big deal. So a big front page story. He resigned. It's interesting. I think this happened, it happened in an Ontario hospital. And uh, the attorney general at the time, Roy McMurtry, another famous name uh, from Canadian politics, he announced short, shortly after, we've looked at this, you know, he could be charged, but it would not be in the public interest to charge him. So he was never charged, never convicted of anything. But this became a bit of an albatross over his political career. He left cabinet. There was an election, 1980, uh, where, you know, Trudeau came back. Uh, he went back to the uh, the cabinet, served for three, three, four years, I guess, until and through the Turner uh, prime ministership. Then uh, he was wiped out in his riding in Quebec by the Mulroney wave in 84 and basically went back into practice, legal practice in Montreal and sort of disappeared from the public view for about 20 years. Um, but, you know, and he had a good legal practice, seems to have done quite well. And then he went back as an aide to Paul Martin back in the early 2000s and became a senator. But what's important about that incident is that my view, and I don't think it's my own, only me, it basically meant that he was, as one person told me, damaged goods when it came to leadership, right? So when, when it came, came, came time to replace Turner, he wasn't an obvious candidate because I think of that history. So I guess, why are people interested? I don't know. Uh, maybe it's because, you know, the whole um, abortion issue is, you know, people see everything in a different light these days. It's 40 years later. Um, politicians, um, he did seem like he was, you know, straight up guy, right? Uh, I think I think if I could interrupt, I I think yeah. for me the the key he had such a promising career. He was such a as I remember a uh, appealing individual, um, a, a very oh, he was handsome, yeah, very articulate communicator. 
um, seemed to have handled his uh, portfolio incredibly well. I think a lot of people thought that he was a potential successor to uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Uh, and uh, and yet, they I felt, I think a lot of people felt he did the right thing. He did the honorable thing. He, he resigned. And that too many politicians don't take responsibility for their actions and try to to excuse their their actions uh, away and and he didn't he just he took responsibility for it uh you know maybe i'm wrong in that regard but i think people yeah, no, i think I mean, the other thing, or you know admitting yeah. his faults the other thing that's a very brief statement you can see it online uh but what i found is really interesting is that he takes responsibility he also makes a point to say, this did not impact my work as a minister. And he specifically, I think, says nobody in my entourage, you know, no deputy minister, none of my assistants, nobody knew about this. So he was he was taking it all on himself, right? Um, which is really the honorable thing to do. But like it or not, he did pay a price. You know, this as perhaps if he had been communications minister, uh, it wouldn't have been as serious a faux pas, but you know, he's in charge of the police. You can't have people signing other people's names. Now, what's really, what really confused me when I was doing the research for this obituary, and you know, I only have a certain amount of time, I'm not, I'm not a historian, is that one of the articles said at the time, and I found this fascinating, that the rules, there was nothing in the rules, like in the criminal code, that said the spouse, the husband, had a sign. It was the hospitals that decided on this. And that in this particular case, it, the, the Therapeutic Abortion Committee had already approved of the procedure. And it seems as if they may have done it in any case, even without the signature. But some official, you know, a nurse or whatever, a doctor, put the... Um, you know, said, oh, this is a form you have to fill out. You need that signature. And that's what happened. So it was a little bit confusing of what had happened at the time and the timing of everything, but uh, whatever. It's, it's, but it, it, what's interesting about Fox, another thing I thought was quite interesting, I spoke to his son, is that he always took interest in politics, in liberal politics, in, um, in Montreal when he left uh, sometimes sort of as a backroom person afterwards, after he'd been a minister. But one of the things he actually did for a time, which I find unbelievable, is that he was president of the local riding association in Verdun, where he lived, after having been a minister, because he felt it was important to sort of still, you know, the party needed rebuilding after the Mulroney years, so got involved in the grassroots. So that shows you that at least for a lot of it, there wasn't that much ego involved. You know, he could have said, I'm not going to do that um, as a, you know, a big time lawyer, but he did. Tell me about uh, any of the personal uh, ramifications of, uh, of what he did. Uh, obviously the professional ramifications were severe. Do we know anything about the, uh, I, the I really don't know. He was, it, it's, he was divorced at, at the time. Uh, and he had had, um, uh, he'd been married for several years. And he subsequently, six months later, married a woman I assume was at the time his girlfriend, and they remained happily married until he passed. So uh, that particular liaison, there are you know, rumors about who the woman actually was, but uh, he seems to have lived and lived a you know very happy married life afterwards. So, what about uh, my comment about that he did the honorable thing? Do you think that's accurate or and that, that, that and that's that. unique for politicians? Well, I don't. Um, it's interesting because all I can talk to you, I, I, what I find is interesting is that the stuff at the time, what was said at the time, um, there were. Now, remember, abortion, there was a whole Morgenthaler stuff going on of, you know, he had gone to jail because uh, he, had, he, had, he had performed illegal abortions. Uh, there was the whole movement to get the uh, get abortion out of the criminal code. So w one of the things that was interesting, what I quoted was the Globe and Mail had for several years 
a uh, a doctor writing a column in the Globe under a pen name. I think it was called Griffin Jones. I don't know if you remember that. I, I really not. Remember. And he wrote this column where he said, you know, he saw this was an example of what was sort of wrong with the abortion law and said, you know, what Francis Fox in, a day, in the end really did was stand by uh, this woman whom, you know, he had uh, had an affair with. And, you know, maybe he should be applauded for this rather than criticized. Now, I'm sure there were people also who criticized what he had done and said, you know, you can't do that as a chief law, law officer of the country. But um, there clearly was a certain amount of sympathy. But I think it was understood that he had no choice but to resign. And remember, he did get back into cabinet after the next election. So in that way, part of the cloud lifted, right? Um, and he was a very um, active communications minister. And, you know, uh, uh, it was, and he was Secretary of State. So he was responsible, you know, CBC and that, and also uh, telecom when, you know, there was a lot more regulation of Bell and, uh, mainly at Bell and the other phone companies. So, uh, but yet, as you said, he wasn't considered for leadership because it was damaged goods. What do you think? You've got long experience in politics. You've followed many of these people. Is that right? That one mistake can damage you? Know. You're considered uh, ineligible. I don't know. You know, uh, I think maybe these days people have shorter memories, and uh, you know, I can't think of. <laughs> examples right off the hand but uh but right off hand i have a feeling that people it, it is quite remarkable how people bounce back in all sorts of professions including my own you know my old profession is being journalists and you see people have done stuff and then suddenly well they're back uh and um i don't know i mean there's certain types of things i don't think you even today you do not bounce back from are all these abuse scandals. I think that really, probably for good reason, ends people's public careers in any case. Um, you know, if you're found to abuse an employee or, you know. Uh, so um, not sure how how times have, have changed. But what's, what's interesting, I, I find, in writing these obituaries is that you try to, I, what I try to do um, is to try to get the sweep of somebody's life, right? And people have long, you know, particularly people live 80, 90 years. There are, you know, um, ups and downs, things that, and things that people don't recall. And, uh, and they're, you know, they're, and also their origin stories are, are often quite fascinating, right? But, you don't really realize, you know, uh, maybe and that can, uh, maybe we can take a break for some messages yeah. back and talk a little bit about how you got into this gig of writing obituaries because it's kind of a unique, uh, kind of unique gig. Um, let's take a break for two minutes. We're going to come back uh, in two minutes with Alan Freeman, a writer, a, a journalist, and a columnist, um, and uh, someone who most recently has written this obituary on Francis Fox. But as I go back through your own history. The the number of obituaries of important people and some really interesting people that may not have been that important but are really quite interesting is uh, is quite impressive. Stay with us, everyone. We're going to be back in just two minutes with Alan Freeman. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. My guest tonight is a very interesting author, uh, journalist, and columnist who's who's recently sort of got this gig, this, this specialty in writing obituaries. And I recently read uh, an obituary that he wrote about Francis Fox, a, a gentleman that, that I thought uh, was really quite a spectacular politician, someone that had a great future within uh, the Canadian political system, and then fell to a, a personal mistake and resigned. And I always thought that that was extremely honorable uh, that he did. Uh, and, and it was a shame and, and not too many people in politics did the honorable thing and took, uh, I thought, responsibility for their actions. And then I started reading about uh, uh, Mr. Freeman and, and sir, you've written so many interesting obituaries about interesting people. 
How did you get into writing obituaries? Like, you know, you, you read about politicians, but you wrote about other reporters, Stevie Cameron, um, entrepreneurs, Robert Schad, uh, who built Husky. How did you get into this business of writing obituaries? Um, well, first of all, I worked for many years for the Globe and Mail. So I'm basically retired. Um, I still do some freelance writing. And I think about oh, a few years ago, uh, another former colleague of mine at the Globe had said, oh, I've been asked to write an obituary for Don Mazinkowski, who was finance minister in the Mulroney era, an Alberta uh, MP who was quite a distinguished finance minister. And he said, I can't do it. Can you do it? Now, you're, I'll be honest with you, it's a freelance gig. It's not, I don't do this uh, to get rich, um, but the Globe and Mail has um, on the, often on the back page of the section in the old paper, a long obituary. And I think it's important for people to realize this is an article written by a journalist. Unlike, you know, a paid obituary that people can put in the newspaper or online or whatever. So I'm writing this from the point of view of a, of a journalist who's trying to write basically a history of somebody's life. So I said to my friend, uh, Barry, I said, Barry, yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess I could do this. I certainly, I worked with Mazinkowski as, uh, you know, I covered him in the 1990s, I guess. And he was a, he was a pretty he was a pretty good guy and a very interesting background because he was the finance minister of Canada and his he began his career as a car dealer in Vegreville, Alberta. So a guy with maybe not very much formal university education in economics, but an extremely able and smart politician. And he understood the economic stuff. Um, so I did it that time, that did it then. And since then, uh, the editor every once in a while comes up and asks me to uh, write one. And I sometimes will see uh, Francis Fox is, is an example. I saw a news story, I think, out of Quebec that he had passed away. I hadn't realized, you know, he's 84, etc. I had, he had not, he had sort of disappeared. Often these people whose names are familiar have disappeared off the radar as they get older. And then you say, oh, my God, he passed or she passed. And then um, I, I guess I, you know, I try not to spend too much time writing them, but I do spend, you know, I'll spend a few days researching these people, trying to speak to people who knew them, family member. Um, and th there's a certain amount of essential information you need in one of the, each one of these obits. But then I try to sort of, um, you know, get a as complete a picture as possible in whatever it is, 1,500 words, of a person's life. And I find this quite an interesting um, uh, process. And, you know, the other thing is, we, uh, to be fair, the, uh, the Globe tries to get obituaries not just of, suppose, you know, in, in quotation marks, famous people, politicians, but interesting people of all kinds. So um, you, you, as an example, find... wrote a really interesting one about um, Major Barry Armstrong, Armstrong, the armed forces surgeon who blew the whistle on abuses committed by the Canadian soldiers right. in, Australia in the 1990s and helped touch off a scandal that rocked Canadians military. I had forgotten all about that story until I read the obit. Right. I mean, that was <laughs> the Somali incident where uh, Canadian armed forces were uh, who were in a, uh, a peacekeeping role in East Africa were found to have uh, um, abused and uh, I think killed uh, some prisoners uh, who had been I think trying to get onto their compound in Somalia. In Somalia, and this led to it was a huge scandal in the Chrétien era. Uh, it led to an inquiry. The inquiry was shut down. And really, Armstrong, who was a military doctor, was a key person in that because he basically was a whistleblower. And what was interesting is that this was a man who really, who was an armed forces surgeon, really dis disappeared off public view until he passed. He'd gone to Dryden, Ontario, 
continued his career um, in Dryden and I think in Thunder Bay. Never so continued to be a doctor, but never recovered his. Uh, he had, there was another incident in Dryden, and really worked as uh, what they called surgeon's assistant for the rest of his life uh, after in the rest of his career. Um, so it was a fascinating, that was another one. That was something where uh, it was somebody who had really disappeared off the radar. The other one that I was really quite <laughs> interested in having done is Phil Edmondson. Do you remember Phil Edmondson? I don't. No, remember. Remember. Okay. So he was the guy who wrote something called Lemonade every year, which was uh, a review of lousy cars, used cars. He wrote a used car guide. He was this, and he became an NDP MP from Quebec. He was an American draft doctor who had moved to Canada, late 70s, settled in Montreal, and then became, he set up something called the Automobile Protection Association when there was a big issue of uh, rusty cars because of... Uh, um, you know, road salt, that cars were rusting out and he was in charge of a consumer group. Anyhow, he had uh, been an MP briefly uh, from Quebec and then basically also disappeared and moved back to the States and ended up dying in Panama. So a fascinating man, uh, a, a personal history that was fascinating, but not typically famous. Do you know right. what I mean? Well, I, I, I was also uh, uh, interested in Sue Johnson, a Canadian psychologist who created and popularized emotionally focused therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and, she was. Not. And, and it sounds like she was really quite instrumental in changing psychology and uh, therapy toward couples. And I didn't know anything about no. this. No, I didn't. Look, I really didn't know. Uh, very much about her, although my <laughs> I have a daughter who's studying to be uh, a therapist and right away said, oh, yeah, I know about Sue Johnson. And in fact, I think I had uh, seen her book um, uh, before, but I had not. And she had and this is an example, again, uh, of somebody who has when you look at their the, 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 the thrust of their life, she had a really interesting personal story in that she was born in England uh, her parents owned a pub, and she she had this great uh, anecdote that she had in one of her books about you know she saw what went on in a pub, in terms of the interaction and the emotion and the you know uh, and that was sort of set her off for becoming a psychologist. So uh, and then she eventually ended up leaving the UK, um, went to BC, studied to be a psychologist there and ended up, I think, as a psychology professor in, uh, in Ottawa and also founded this basic uh, movement. Um, and wrote a book uh, called Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, a self-help guide to emotional focus therapy. Sold over a right. million copies. Yeah. Um, sounds, I, I, I want to go read the book now and find out what these uh, the, this uh, Hold Me Tight is all about. Yep. So, I mean, you have to be, uh, so, so I do, I do try, I've written a lot of political stuff, but I do, uh, I have written about other things. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that um, in doing these things, I usually, if it's a well-known person, I usually say, look and see, did they write a memoir, right? And if I see that, get it from the library. The other thing is there's a huge amount of material online these days you have to you know get it from uh reputable sources but there's all sorts of uh uh and i like what i like to do as well is to uh if possible not just do interviews but uh if you can find interviews that these people have given um either to newspapers or uh tv etc in the past or remember is to have them tell their story if you can have a few quotes throughout the story of them explaining their lives, then I think it's um, it's very helpful uh, as an obituary writer. Well, and then you wrote about Stevie Cameron, who, uh, you know, I guess ironically, um, we had uh, the funeral of, uh, of former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney this year, and, and then you wrote the obituary for 
Stevie Cameron, who, uh, as you say, was uh, Brian Mulroney's nemesis and uh, wrote the book about uh, about um, corruption during the Mulroney era. Right. That was that, well, that was an interesting one to do. Again, there was controversy, and again, this is a, the other thing about this type of writing is that there was controversy in her career as well. She wrote this, you know, blockbuster. A uh, book called On the Take came out just after the end of the Mulroney years, talking about all the corruption scandals within in the Mulroney years. And uh, then there was this long running issue. Uh, well, I don't want to get into it too much of the Airbus um, kickbacks and, and the allegations, which were never proven um, against Mr. Mulroney and some of his. Uh, um, you know, former colleagues about, you know, whether they were kickbacks, et cetera. And uh, in, he, she wrote about that and the, the RCMP had this really aborted investigation into the whole thing. Uh, Mr. Mulroney ended up getting money from the Canadian government for, um, you know, uh, you know, these, what proved to be uncorroborated, uncorroborated allegations. And it turned out during the, long running trials at, um, and hearings around it surrounding this that it turned out that Stevie had ended up been considered by the RCMP as a, as a, what they call a confidential informant and this was very controversial within the journalistic community and she had originally denied it and this was a long running so it was a I must admit this one was not an easy one to write because I wanted to be fair to her, but it was an issue, right? Uh, which uh, uh, um, was, you know, ha hung over her career, at least among other journalists, that she had been helping out the cops uh, and not admitting it. But she claimed it was all a misunderstanding. Anyhow, so, the, you know, these things are complicated. People have complicated lives. That's the other thing that you have to realize when you write these things is that in some cases, people don't just have, you know, people have, sometimes they have a couple of relationships. Uh, one man I wrote about who was a businessman, you would have thought from what, there were two different obituaries written, one in Canada, one in the U.S., which had almost <laughs> different facts in them, written by different parts of his family. Um, and it turns out, that one of them, it sounded as if he'd only been married once. It turned out he'd been married four times. It was so complicated to figure out who his survivors were. Uh, so it, it, it can actually be a little bit of a of a detective job too. Fascinating uh, retirement uh, gig you've got. Right. Um, you're also very involved in, uh, in politics and political writing. Uh, and I understand that you're part of... Uh, a talented group uh, that is providing expert analysis on U.S. politics in the run-up to the presidential election for Les Affaires. Maybe we could take another break uh, for some messages and come back and chat with you a little bit about uh, that part of your uh, your current writing. Stay with, the, every, stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in just two minutes with Alan Freeman, a writer, a journalist, and a fascinating columnist. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crabby Radio Hour. My guest tonight uh, is Alan Freeman. He is a writer, a journalist, and a columnist. Uh, we've been chatting uh, for the last little while about some of the obituaries that he's been writing. But, sir, you've got also uh, quite an active role in uh, political commentary. And one of them is working uh, with Les Affaires, the, the, the business uh, newspaper in Quebec, writing about what's going on in the U.S. election. Uh, there was an interesting debate just this past week. Uh, Conrad Black and uh, and Martha Hall Finley and other people were uh, debating back and forth about whether uh, the election of Donald Trump would be a positive or a negative for Canada. Um, you know, I think that lots of people are showing a great deal of interest in what's going on in uh, the U.S. election right now. What do you think uh, the outcome of the U.S. election is going to be? Where do you think it's going? And what's the impact potentially on Canada? Oh, my God. Well... I'm not really a, a prognosticator. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a betting man. Uh, it looks still. I just look at the, the polls. Um, I may have my personal views, but uh, the polls certainly seem to show that um, it's extremely close. 
including in in those important swing states, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, whatever. Um, so I think it's, I, I'm sorry? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, right. It's still very close. And then, and of course, the other ones, North Carolina, Georgia. The, um, so it, it, it's quite remarkable how um, divided that country is and has been over the last three election cycles. Um, it looks as if, um, I guess one thing is clear is that if the Democrats hadn't replaced Biden, it would be a romp, I think, for um, for, for Trump. He, I think he would have won quite easily. Now it's still up in the air. Um, one thing is that, and it's hard to tell, the um, the polls, uh, I'm amazed at how the polls managed to still get um, really quite, seem to be quite accurate considering the fact that nobody answers their phone anymore. You know, the, the response rate is like two and a half percent. Um, and so they have to make an amazing number of calls and then they have to adjust the figures because, but, you know, they figured out how to do it, I guess. So polls are there. And one thing is that I don't know what, whether this will continue, you know, in the midterms, the Democrats outperform the polls. Now, will this happen again? I really don't know. Um, you know, and I guess, um, and the thing is, it's quite amazing is that what are the impact, you know, what will affect people's voting? From all accounts, uh, what you could see, what I could see, um, Harris did extremely well in that first debate or that first and only debate. Um, she got a really tiny bump in the numbers. Um, so it shows you how um, really fixed people's views. I think there are that many undecided out there. Um, I guess one of the things is getting people out to vote. And I guess that was a, one of the big advantages of changing for Harris is that it got Democrats more excited. So they're more likely to come out to vote. But who knows? Who knows? We've got. So I think know, the interesting vehicle. thing about the uh, the debates and the polls, and you pointed it out with your comment about the swing states, is that it is only you know maybe a hundred thousand people that are relevant. Uh, there is going to be, uh, yeah. and, and this is something that in 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 Canada, um, you know, we we don't I think understand to the uh, the same extent because of the way that the electoral college yeah. works in the United States. Now we do as well because. You know, we'll talk about how the nine to five decides elections. There are similarly swing areas, but they don't go 100 percent one way or 100 percent the other way. Um, you know, the way that the electoral system works such that uh, there is, you know, the middle swath of the United States that almost always votes um, blue uh, Republican and uh, and the Ku coasts that uh, tend to vote uh, red uh, um and uh, and for Democrats. And so therefore, as you pointed out, there's like uh, five states. And in those five states, it's a couple tens of thousands of votes mm -hmm. in state. And so you don't have to have more than a, a one point national change in the public uh, opinion to be a very significant percentage in those five states. And yeah. so that's why debates, I think, do matter even though you may not catch it in the overall, because the relevant right. is the percentage in those five states. That, well, the uh, other they, thing is, is that actually the 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 the, the candidates really emphasize the, those important states. I mean, no question. What's what's the point of Kamala Harris uh, going to California? It's her home state. She's going to win it, you know. And the the electoral college votes are what they are. She's going to win it no matter what. Why waste her time going there, except maybe to do some fundraising? The other thing is that the other thing for for Canadians, first of all, there are a couple of things about the American system, which I think is very hard for Canadians to understand, is the value of being an incumbent. Like there are very few change, um, you know, members of the House or the Senate who will change. You know, if we have a Canadian election tomorrow we get probably swept out of office, all sorts of NDP liberals who've been there forever, right? Um, 
that won't happen in the U.S., right? And, 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 and isn't that because in the United States, you have a different ballot for president versus right. Senate versus House of Representatives versus governor versus, uh, and in Canada, if you want to, you know, vote, you've got one in a federal right. one vote. And also the thing is we have more than we have now, we have multiple parties sometimes. And don't, and if you think it's hard to predict what's going on here, uh, what's going on in the U.S., like when you have uh, a three or four way race in a Canadian constituency, you can, can you predict who's going to get people can, you know, you, you can win a by-election with 28, 30% of the vote. Like, how do you ever, well, how do you, you can do that, that? and, and with only 20% of the people turning out. So it's even, yeah. so it's, it's very hard. So but, incumbency is incredibly important in the U S which is not the case here. The other thing that is amazing is spending. Right, you know, we have very strict spending limits on and donation limits. Election. Yeah, and donation limits. I was reading something uh, just recently about the Senate race in Montana, where there's a longtime Democrat called I think John Tester, who looks as if he's on the ropes. Uh, uh, he'll, you know, good chance he's going to lose to the Republican. It's a state with one million people. Apparently, they have spent. Uh, they're expected to have spent a hundred million dollars on that campaign, right? And that's not, and I guess it's one million people, and only it's one million voters. It's it's mind boggling the amount of money that gets spent through PACs or whatever thing. Which you know, again, we have to uh, Canadians are probably hard to understand. But look, whatever happens, I guess the 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 issue is that people are wondering what. The impact is on uh, you know Canada U.S. relations. Um, you know, look, we didn't do all that well in some ways uh, with, with with Trump. You know, Trump was um, you know stuck this uh, uh, you know this uh, tariff on Canadian steel and aluminum, which was really uh, pretty rough. But in the end, you know, the we ended up doing quite well on the. Uh, renewal of NAFTA. We didn't, in, in terms of, of you know, not losing out too much. Um, look, it, I have a, I have a maybe a slightly different view of Canada-U.S. relations than some do. I, I did. I was based in in Washington for uh, for several years, um, and I think it upsets Canada. Uh, and Canadians often that were taken for granted by the Americans. And I would argue that in some ways, that's not a bad, that's not a bad thing in that. What does it mean by taking for granted? I mean, we're, it's assumed that we're a fr largely friendly country, that we're dependable, uh, reliable as a supplier, and uh, we don't make waves. So, and we are... You know, we are stuck with the Americans. It's our biggest market. It's the easiest place. You know, when you talk to Canadian, you know, there are always governments or academics who are telling Canadian business, you have to expand and uh, diversify your export markets. I mean, come on, tell some producer of a, an advanced industrial part in, in southern Ontario uh, that he should really be focusing his efforts on Japan or um, I don't know, Dubai for exports when, you know, four hours away on a truck, he can get his product into, you know, a huge market where they speak the same language, they do business the same way. So we really depend on that access to the US. Um, and to continue my argument, the thing is about, is that we do well when nobody, when the Americans don't think too much about Canada, because the when Canada gets in the news in the U.S. on Canada-U.S. issues, it's usually not in a good way, right? It's, you know, Canada is not letting Wisconsin cheese get into Canada, or we're not spending enough on defense, or whatever, right? Um, so I think... So best to be ignored. Best to be ignored... <laughs> in some, in a good way, particularly. And the thing about one of the things you have to remember when it comes, I'm talking about trade largely, but 
the thing about Canada is that so much of our trade is really invisible to Americans. Do Americans know where their aluminum comes from? Do they know that their Toyota is, it was built in, in Southern Ontario? They have no clue. It's sort of just, you know, or let alone our lumber or our oil. It's unlike sort of, uh, uh, you know, you're not seeing made in China or made in Bangladesh right in your face or, you know, or German made cars. So it's, it's, it's invisible. And I think it upsets Canadians a lot of way that we're not, we don't get more credit, you know, and that we're not, we're not seen as an important, um, trade as important a trading partner as we actually are, but you know, so maybe we just the, live with that. One of the things that's come out, um, that a lot of people didn't realize is that Kamala Harris spent, I think it was five years uh, in uh, Westmount at uh, Westmount High School. In Montreal. In Montreal. Um, do you think that will be helpful to Canada if she wins? Or, you know, the no. fact that she's tried to keep it completely quiet, um, yeah. it could be relevant at all. It's a very, it's an interesting thing because I'm fascinated by it, is that not only did she spend five years there, her mother, spent basically most of her professional life 16 years as a cancer researcher at McGill University and the Jewish Hospital in Montreal. So she she stayed there well beyond, um, you know, Kamala went away to the to university in the States, but she stayed on. Now, it's interesting. I, I think what's what's fascinating, I think it's good, you know, especially if she becomes president, to have somebody who knows Canada, right? And has that connection. What's interesting is that I don't think she likes to emphasize it because I'll be honest, she's got to prove to uh, skeptical people that she's a real American, right? And obviously she is, right? So she has to, she has, um, you know, an interesting background, half Jamaican, um, half Indian. She doesn't want to complicate things by, by telling people that she spent many of her formative years, all her teenage years in Canada, right? I think that is just too complicated. So she's not going to, she's not going to emphasize that, unfortunately. And, and in fact, in her, she keeps on saying how she missed then when she was in Canada, all she did was miss uh, being back in California. So it is what it is, but yeah, it's, you know, I think it's usually better to have uh, American presidents who have some familiarity with Canada. Remember, there's a whole history of that. You know, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a, you know, there was this family camp compound in New Brunswick, Campobello Island. He spent much uh, of his life uh, in, you know, uh, well, you know, in the summers, et cetera, in Campobello Island. So we've got some of these, um, uh, President Taft, I don't you know, you know who was early 20th century, the Taft family had a, uh, a summer house in Murray Bay in Quebec. I think there still is, um, there still may be still some Tafts up there in the, the Charlevoix region. So those connections, I think, are useful. Um, uh, you, know, you know, I guess George W. Bush was from um, Texas, but his dad, you know, had, you know, their summer place was up in Maine, so they know where Canada was. So I think that's helpful. Um, but, you know, Canada and... Canada doesn't figure high on people's political radar in general, unless there's an issue. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's a fact of life. And I don't think, I think Canadians are fooling themselves if they think that um, it's going to change. Now, it's interesting that Justin Trudeau, because largely because of his father, got, you know, he's, he was on Stephen Colbert a couple of weeks ago, right? I don't sure it's helped him anywhere, any, any, in any way politically here. Now I'm not sure Pierre Polyev would get on Stephen Colbert, but I don't know. No, I don't know. I watched that uh, Stephen Colbert interview. He he did far better than he's done in a lot of Canadian interviews, if not yeah. the most Canadian interviews. He came across incredibly personable, um, humorous, honest. Um, 
and real. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, too often in Canada, um, he does not come across that way. So I, if anyone, but, but, I'd you know, be encouraging him to do more. You're the communications expert, but I'd be encouraging him to do more things like that. I understand he was recently on a podcast with uh, with one of his uh, fellow yeah. uh, backband champions, and similarly did a great job. Uh, sir, we've got to take, uh, we got to finish this. So we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, you've been an incredible guest. You've got a wealth of knowledge. Uh, the obituaries that you've been writing have been fascinating. Um, I wish we could spend the full hour talking about some of your political commentary. So maybe uh, you'll honor us by coming back uh, some point in time and uh, and telling us about some of uh, your political opinions and uh, and commentary. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. Good night, Alan Freeman. Appreciate it. Thanks.